You see, something's going to happen. What? What's going to happen? Something wonderful. What? I understand how you feel. You see, it's all very clear to me now. Welcome to the Occult Rejects. On uh, this episode, we have got uh, myself, and we also have Lisa, the uh, Occult Reject Med Scientist, co-host of the Occult Rejects with us today, as usual, and uh, we also got B.D. Salerno, as uh, we got these three Occult Rejects for you today in this episode. And uh, this episode has also been brought to you by B.D. Salerno. Uh, this was her idea. It was her topic. Um and I'm sure for people who have listened in the past, um, you know, like when it comes to her covering a topic, it is rather thorough. And uh, like I used to call story time with Robbie Marks, well, we got story time with BD Salerno when she covers a topic. Uh, I definitely think it will be thorough. I think it will be very interesting. And she's very good at what she does when it comes to the occult and uh, the witchcraft. So uh, buckle up. This should be interesting. And uh, thank you very much, BD, and uh, I'll let you take it away from here. If anything, let us know what made you even want to cover this case. Well, I was um, always really fascinated, not fascinated, more in, in, in a morbid way with the murder of John Benet Ramsey because it was a, a little kid murdered on Christmas night, and it was the most horrific thing you could imagine. And it always stayed with me because nobody ever figured out to this day who was responsible. Although it, the, the suspect field is real narrow. Most people think it's the parents or an associate of the parents. A lot of people think it's her, her brother. But it's it's one of those things that never goes away. And so when I was, I was preparing my second book, I was looking at a lot of what the ancient astrologers had to say about that type of a murder because there were certain rules if you saw certain combinations of planets this would suggest possibly a murder by a parent murder by a wife and i did chapters on that and john benet was in the chapter murder or danger from parents and i remember when i did that chapter i did straight crime astrology on it and as the years that was about 10 years ago i'll make one quick shameless plug the book is exploring forensic astrology Okay, plug over. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? Real quick, real quick. Yeah, for the, for some yeah. of the true crime people, there's people even coming across this that have never heard this before. I mean, listen, now, my, my opinion, I kind of agree where there might be something up with the family. I highly suspect the brother myself. But there mm -hmm. was uh, Teresa on the Spiritual Gangsters has had uh, a guest on that like is real, real, real close with the brother <laughs> and does yeah. talk about it on the show. So... If anybody wants to go check out The Spiritual Gangsters, she does have an episode with a uh, person who is very close to the brother. Might be interesting to listen to what he talks about. Yeah, I have to check that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, my opinion, I think this is my opinion. I think they covered that shit up so well that, like, even the family and friends have no idea what the fuck happened. They did it, They did do a good job. It was an elaborate cover-up. I'm going to go a little, little bit into that today, but... Because um, not for nothing, the kids sound like you drank the Kool-Aid when it comes to that situation. <laughs> In the very beginning, for a couple of years, I did not think the parents were guilty. I was just, I wasn't into crime astrology when the crime occurred. I was just getting into it. I did not think the parents did it. I believed in the intruder theory until I started uh, some years later really examining that standpoint and then going back and examining the rest of it. Now I can look at it one glance at this and say this is a totally staged event that did not happen the way it went down. But I had to go through that period where I had to learn the crime astrology to be able to pick it apart. And in my book, I did commit to the theory that the parents were responsible. Now, looking back at it in a slightly different viewpoint, because I've I, I keep learning new things, and I've learned so much in 10 years. So going back, and now, because the recent passion of mine is the Greek astrology and the asteroids, and the asteroids all fit into astrology as much as the planets and i'm learning more and more that they are in fact more detailed and more specific and lend more color to a story so i'm like right now obsessed with with um, asteroids in greek mythology learning them so i decided to look back at john benet which was always a crime that was disturbing and upsetting to me and um started looking at it in the past 
couple of months. And um, so I let you know, I was like, I have a whole new idea on this based on what I've been learning. And uh, from that standpoint, I have to say in my book, I was looking at ancient techniques much the way I am now. But what really flipped me in that book was I was working with this uh, second century astrologer. I think he was, he was a Turkish astrologer named Vedius Valens. And he said some of the positive things in John Bonet's chart, he didn't say this, I'm saying this, but some of the positive things in her chart that he described in his book related directly to her. She did not have a lot of positive things in her chart. I mean, the poor girl didn't even live to be seven years of age. She had major stress, major violence in her birth chart, and it would have been very difficult to, to survive those early years, unfortunately. Um, but what he said about her particular gift, which was Venus Jupiter, which is a beautiful thing to have because Venus is beauty and love. Jupiter is expansion and beneficence. And John Bonet embodied that. She was a beautiful girl. She was bubbly. She had a wonderful personality. She was adventurous. I mean, she had had it going on. If she had become an adult, she would have been a phenomenal adult. But what he said about her with the particular thing that uh, the Venus Jupiter was, it confers preeminence among the masses, including honors of garlands and gold crowns. And that caught me because John Bonet if you want to show the, the one pic, couple of pictures that you were putting up. John Bidet was, as you know, a beauty pageant contestant. Her mother was entering her into all kinds of beauty pageants, even as a toddler. And she won some of them, and she was wearing gold crowns and tiaras, um, which I think is the second picture that you have has her showing a crown. And that was really mind-blowing that somebody would have described what is in her astrology chart like 2,000 years ago. It's still true. The stuff never changes. So I'm just going to shut that off. Sorry. Okay. So anyway, looking back, I just reviewed everything, all the work I had done on her previously, adding in the asteroids, which are all based, mostly based on Greek mythology, I wanted to see, to test out again, the ancient theories in regard to her life and her, you know, her eventual demise. And it was eye-opening and it was even more specific. And it, it made me realize something that when we resonate to a huge event like the death of a pretty young girl, there's something more deeper in the collective unconscious that we're responding to. And I think that's coming through the, the myths Myths are part of our a, a psychological imprint. They've been around for thousands of years. We relate to them. We resonate to them, even though they are about things that happened thousands of years ago. Human nature does really not change at all. And so what happened with John Bonet? I think the fact that she was a beauty queen and she had won beauty pageants and she was like a little princess. And so a lot of the myths that I started to delve into were about princesses who had horrible fates and there are many of them in greek mythology i could have gone through probably 20 i kept it to maybe three or four you know one, one question yeah. i want to ask um only because i i'm you know i don't know you know this there's times where i have guests on to cover topics that i know nothing about so unfortunately they could be spitting anything and i have to take their stuff at face value as being you know truthful um, I've had other people on that had said that, um, and I was wondering if it is truthful, I just never looked into it, um, that some of the pageants, you can't even prove that they even existed. Did you ever notice if anything like that ever came up for you? Or did you? No, because I never looked into them. I, I never checked them out to see how real they were. Okay. I, I didn't. No, I, I, don't I was just know, wondering. So I can't say they, they did say I mean, that, and I was, like, hmm. me, but I was like, that's I don't know. weird. Well, because if that's the truth, you have to start wondering, like, what was really going on there? Was that well, like you, we, I did? We, I did wonder what was really going on. Realizing, uh, see, when this happened in 1996, we weren't hit to pedo rings. We were not thinking that's that. That's what that I was, was going to get into. Unfortunately, an incident. Yeah, it's a good well, way to advertise yeah, your products. It's, it's, it's inevitable that we get into it here because back then, I believe these were venues. I mean, they were heavily photographed. These girls. These might have been venues. Maybe it was a staged event for photographing these girls and then distributing these photographs to people who wanted to get to know them, who wanted to spend good money 
to become acquainted with, with them. People who were maybe wealthy enough and influential enough to sway a parent to like, okay. oh, I just awesome. want to meet you. Awesome. You know, stuff like that going on. So th- it was a possibility because I did notice when I would watch th- these videos of these events, there's a ton of photography, photographers all over the place. So. And it was creepy. It was these girls were, to make a bad pun about photography, they were overexposed. They were seen in, you know, by everyone indiscriminately. There could have been a whole black market for this kind of thing, for all I know. Back then, I never thought that. Yeah. You know, sadder but wiser now, we do think that way. We are aware of that going on. Mm. So, and well, I think that may factor into what happened to her, and I will try. We'll get into down the road here. Uh, real and quick, st- real quick too. I just want to plug yeah. one solved mystery. Uh, thank you very much. They said all the pageants that John Benet participated in oh, has good. been accounted for, and I'm just assuming they might know what's up because if you're into this case, that whole channel, from what I noticed earlier when I checked it out, seems like all John Benet stuff. So. Uh, there might be a lot, a lot of stuff on that channel. So if you're into this case, go check out One Solved Mystery because you'll find plenty of John Benet's stuff yeah, over there. that's interesting. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah, the uh, comments. Thanks for posting that, really. <laughs> that's great to know because I didn't know the answer myself. Yeah. All right, so go ahead. I'm sorry. So Just anyway, no, I was going to say that the, we resonate to some of these stories and, and it, it, it touches us on such a deep level. And I think I'm making a connection with why. If, for example, we look at the year after John Benet, we lost Princess Diana. Princess Diana's death in that car crash, it, it disrupted people on an emotional level to a, a level I've never seen. Nobody's ever seen that outpouring of grief and really deep feeling for the princess. I mean, they must have had, they had to remove tons and tons of flowers from Buckingham Palace. They were in rows and rows of flowers. They had to have like uh, excavators taking the flowers out of there. There was so much overwhelming grief her death people were so affected by it but when you think about it in the collective consciousness here is a princess a beautiful blonde again blonde golden girl princess who marries her prince charming because she really was in love with charles she was her prince charming she marries him they're supposed to be queen and king they're supposed to rule in in peace and safety over their kingdom Instead, he cheats on her. She finds another lover. She's trying to restart her life after the divorce. And boom, they get killed in this horrendous car crash. The royal family was distant and aloof. Pissed off a lot of people. Charles was cavorting with um, Camilla Parker Bowles at the time. People were angry about that. And it was just something that people were extremely emotionally upset about for a long, long time. You know what's really weird, I find, with that situation, too? And, like, sometimes I, like, I wonder if this has something to do with it. Because it's just, unfortunately, humans are the way they are. You know how many women that I know that could turn around and say they think Princess Diana was an amazing woman? And the only thing, in fact, they they could tell you is that she died in a car crash. Yeah. I'm being honest. I'm I'm just being straight up true story. I hate to tell you. I don't... Yeah, I mean, there's plenty. Oh, but she, but she was so pretty. She was so cute. What the fuck does that have to do with the personality? But that, they, that's the point. They associate it with tragedy. And the point I'm, I'm, I'm making is that the myths of these tragic princesses, who were goddesses, I'm going to use the word interchangeably, princess, goddess. They were, there were so many tragic young princesses in mythology and John Benet embodies every one of them to a certain extent. And I'm going to link them to the myths because they're right in her birth chart and they are right in the crime chart. They are out there screaming, this is me. I'm reliving this. This is a part of human nature. This has gone on with humanity for centuries, thousands of years, millennia. So that's what I think touches us on that level. Is there, the Diana had her prince charming, he, charming and he treated her like dirt. And then she got killed. People were devastated. It wasn't that myth is not supposed to go that way. It is supposed to have a, a healthier, happier ending. John Benet, little princess, golden girl, literally, she is born under the sun sign of Leo, which is the sun she wants to shine, just like Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, was a Leo. She wanted to shine. She wanted to be in the public view, and. Um, there's something to be said about that with the Leo because once again, the Leo is royalty. In fact, John Benet is born August 6, 1990, 
which is two days before what we call the Lion's Gate. It is a portal where the sun conjoins uh, with the fixed star Sirius in the sky. It's always around, it's 8-8, August 8th of every year, 8-8. And that is a time when people who are so inclined will do a lot of magic rituals. So John Bonet is born right before that. She's born on the day of a lunar eclipse, which was not over North America. It was over East Africa. But I wonder what kind of rituals might have been going on in that part of the world because it was the, the eve of the Lion's Gate portal opening with the sun in Sirius. So John Bede is born right in that part where it leads you to think something traumatic, something uh, generational is going to happen to her. She's going to have a lot more meaning than just a girl born in August two parents in Atlanta, Georgia. And again with the Leo, as I talked about with Black Dahlia, the father figure is not doing his job. He's not protecting her. He's not providing her with a safe, happy life. It's much like Black Dahlia's father. It's the same kind of thing repeating again. The Leo needs a strong role model because they are born into royalty. They have to have a succession. And I'm just saying metaphorically, not everybody's going to be a princess or a queen but anyway it's the same thing lacking and we'll see in her chart her father didn't protect her on the contrary i will get into what i think was going on and so um nick if you want to put up the um what john benet natal i think it says yeah john benet writes that one okay that's on august 6 1990 and um you know not for nothing but i even do feel yeah. like a lot of people that we have covered on this show when you do their charts, it's very much that same design. Or it's very much like half of it is always on one side. Yeah. You know how I've said, well, I just, I do find that interesting. I mean, I know that can happen. Patterns. That can happen they, a yeah, lot like that. There are patterns, anyway. absolutely. Yeah. This pattern in this one is really heavy duty. On this one, if you could see on the, the last line I have on the bottom of the list there, it says Grand Cross. Well, look, the top to bottom, a line. Left to right, a line. That is a grand cross. That is about the most stressful thing. It, literally, it's a cross to bear in your life. It produces a lot of stress. I've seen that in people that did not live very long, like John Bonet. It's just too many things happen to them that they can't deal with. They're under assault in, in certain ways from different influences, different energies. And in her case, she had a grand cross in fixed signs, and fixed signs are the toughest. Fixed sign being Leo. We have Leo, Taurus, Aquarius, and Scorpio. And those are, that is a tough combination to deal with under stress. So I think the chart was telling, when I first saw her birth chart, I was like, no wonder she didn't live that long. I mean, it's just a hard, a hard hand to be dealt. But um, about her, a note about her father again. He had a really interesting view of his kids. He was married previous to Patsy Ramsey, to his first wife, and they had three kids. His son from that first marriage, he named John Bennett Ramsey Jr. John Bennett is born to Patsy, John and Patsy Ramsey, and he names her John Bennett, which is a, a, a you know reworking of John Bennett. He had to somehow imprint his identity onto his kids, not just his first son, but his daughter, and I think in some way he had this attachment to her that was maybe not altogether wholesome to name her after himself. And he already has a, a, a child named John Bennett. So I thought that was an interesting thing about her birth. Um, he doesn't represent well in her chart, neither does Patsy as the mother. Um, as I said, there was a lunar eclipse when she was born. That means the sun was in opposition to the moon and that's stress between the parents. Sometimes I've known a lot of full moon people, their parents were so engaged in their own drama that they really didn't take really good care of the kids. And I'm not saying it's always physical neglect. Patsy doted on John Bonet, but to an extent where she was putting on makeup and these costumes and bringing her to pageants all the time. I think Patsy was reliving her own childhood as a beauty queen, which she was when she grew up in uh, Georgia. So she has the full moon to contend with. She's got a really ugly opposition, Mars, Pluto, and it's exact at 15 Leo. And 15 Leo is a, a really dangerous degree in astrology. So when you have Mars there, which is a violent planet, can rule rape, 
which in this case it does. And it's in opposition to Pluto. That tells me right away there was there was definite abuse going on. It was undercover, 12th to 6th house. It was a big secret. But I would look at that in any crime chart and know that that's abuse. And I would not contest it. But what I was saying about full moon people, they are also very gifted people. They are extremely creative people. Like Michael Jackson, for example, was a full moon baby. And I've known full moon people. One is a writer. They're very creative. One's a musician, extremely gifted people, but they have they have energies to deal with that can be quite stressful. So rather than go whole hog into her chart this way, I want to look at it now in terms of the myths I've talked about and how she identifies so totally with these past princesses who met difficult fates. The first one, to tell, actually Ganymede is a little boy. Now, when we see these asteroids in crime charts, it keys us into an activity or a personality or an identity of a person that fits the story. It tells you more about the story. So when I see Ganymede, I think, all right, either abduction or abuse or both. Ganymede was a young boy that Zeus, the lead god, whatever, Zeus got attracted to him and wanted him as his plaything and his servant boy. So Ganymede was kidnapped and Zeus brought him into his home and he became his gopher, his servant boy. And Ganymede would be carrying water. So he got the designation, the, the cup bearer or the water bearer. And you get rewarded sometimes in mythology, even when you've been put through shit your whole life. He was given the designation Aquarius, the water bearer. So Ganymede represents Aquarius. But when you see Ganymede, you have to think of what happened to the little boy in the myth. This is a, a, a child who is taken against his will for to be used. So I have to tick that box when I'm looking at that in, in her birth chart. The next one, Nictimony, is probably the most miserable goddess in Greek mythology. She had a real tough time. Nictimony was a beautiful young girl, and her father was very attracted to her. So his father her father rather, helped himself to her. And they were, he committed incest. And what happened in her environment was people started to victim blame. They well, she seduced him. Come on, he wasn't raping her. She seduced him. It's her fault. Da, da, da. So Nick, Nick Timoney got so shamed and so disgraced by what was going on and by the reaction of people. Nobody was really supporting her. So she ran away to the forest and lived in the forest and she would not allow her face to be seen. She would never allow anybody to come near her because she was so ashamed and disgraced by what had been done to her. So goddess Athena felt sorry for her and made her into an owl. And now when you see Athena in depictions of art and statuary, Athena has an owl, the owl of wisdom. She was given the, the designation owl of wisdom. But McTimony's fate against her will, she's abused and taken away, and she's very ashamed of what's going on with her. So add to Ganymede, McTimony, and then we come to Dejanira. And Dejanira was uh, married to Helios. I think Helios was might have been a son of Zeus, I and mean, Zeus had zillions of kids. But anyway, Dejanira was married to Helios. She was traveling one day, was trying to get across a river, and the centaur, which is half man, half horse, named Nessus, said, well, I'll take you across the river because I'm half horse and I can go through the river. But in the middle of the river, he attacks her and tries to rape her. So Helios kills him. And so Dejanira escapes the, the fate of abuse, but it's been tried. She's been tricked and duped into thinking she's safe and she's not safe. And that shows up in this chart. I think I made notations of the planets. I should have, but um, yeah, De Janeiro was part of the Grand Cross. Um, the next one, Tantalus. Oh my God, we have already seen Tantalus. I don't know how many times in Smiley Face Killers series. Tantalus being a temptation, something you want that you can't have but you really want it. Tantalus was a god who wanted things and was greedy. But he, by, he did something bad. I don't remember what it was, but he, his punishment was he could never have what he wanted. So Tantalus is associated with Jean Benet, her appearance. 
And she's somebody that probably a lot of, you know, men of that persuasion craved. They wanted her. They were interested in her. Men that would have wanted her photograph to look at. She's tantalizing. That's where that word comes from. Um, oh, the next next asteroid. Now I have to go into a little side ex- explanation of that. Next asteroid is Bennett. I have said that they all the asteroids were named uh, after Greek mythology, and that is the rule by the official naming Smithsonian Institute. But there are also minor independent astronomers who locate asteroids because they are all over the place. They're you know so common. What they did for a long time years ago was sell the right to name an asteroid after yourself, which sounds like fun. Somebody gave me that as a birthday present. I was supposed to sign up B.D. Salerno as a star. I thought, well, this is great, and I never did it. By the time I got around to it, I found out there was a deadline, which I had missed, and I couldn't get a star named after myself, which was too bad. But anyway, there are many, many asteroids. There's a whole database of like thousands of asteroids that are named after people. So what you can do is take names of people if you find them on the list and see if they apply in the chart of of people, birth charts of people, event charts of people. And Bennett, which is John Bonet's, you know, mutated middle name, is in her chart featured prominently, and I thought, this is wild. I've seen other astrologers do this with names when they're looking at crime events, and it works. It's, it names people, which is kind of scary. I've seen it in a number of cases where somebody was a suspect and their name was prominent in the chart. Of course, it's not evidence. You can't bring it to court, but it's really interesting that it works that way. And so Bennett is in there, and um, that there were even more than that, just in her birth chart alone, which I want to mention, she is zero degrees Gemini rising. We talked about Gemini last night quite a bit. And so she had, in a way, two personas. She was actually not the dainty little princess girl that we see in the videos and photographs. John Bonet was a tomboy. She was a rough and tumble kid. She loved to play rough. She got into stuff. She was sassy. She had a mouth on her. She had a, a personality and a half. She wasn't this dainty little figurine, you know, that walked around on stage with a crown on her head. So she was trying to live two ways. Um, she did not always want to do what her mother was putting her into doing. She wanted to just sometimes stay home and play. And her mother's like, no, you got to get made up. you got to get into this dress. You have to learn this song. You have to do this dance. So she was being pushed into uh, like a dual life even early on in her life. And um, it, it didn't go well because I think a lot of that exposure led up to what, you know, her eventual demise. So um, I think that, oh yeah. I think the event chart has the rest of what I'm looking at. I haven't even talked about the crime yet, but I wanted to get through these these archetypes of of mythical people because I really think there is something to that, people living out an archetype, people responding and resonating to these stories because really what the astrology birth chart is telling you is the story of your life, blueprint of your life. You don't follow it to a T. You can make choices, but it pretty much in a funny way tells you what choices you are likely to make under certain circumstances. So I think the connection of this to mythology is extremely real and extremely palpable. And I think from now on, I'm, I might just as exclusively do it based on that because it is giving me so much information and is making so much sense because we live patterns of behavior basically. And that's telling us what patterns they are what we resonate to, what's in our collective consciousness past as a, as a race of people. So um, in Jomine's case, she has a really unfortunate birth chart, which leads, suggests a violent death, which she absolutely had. And um, if you want to go, Nick, to the next one, the crime chart has even more stuff going on. And look at what I, right in the middle again, Tantalus. Uh. Tantalus is so predominant, and she tantalized people. People were attracted to her. There's another um, aspect in there. There's a, I think it's either nebula or a galaxy. I am not sure which it is, but it is a, a mass 
mass of stars. It might even be a mass of galaxies called the Great Attractor. It's called the Great Attractor because our galaxy is very, very slowly through magnetism being drawn toward it. It's not going to happen in our lifetime. It is like maybe, I don't know how many inches a year, what have you, but there is a great attractor in the universe and we're slowly, gradually moving toward it. And yet for it to show up as an aspect in John Bonet's chart describes her. She was, she attracted, she was magnetic. People with Gemini rising are, have a certain magnetism. They're sparkly. They have like a sparkle to their eyes. She had pretty blue eyes and people were mesmerized by her. She was charming. So she was a great attractor, much to her, you know, misfortune. Um, the first asteroid, I'm going to talk about these before I talk about the crime, just to get a background of, of what's going on with these, with these entities of mythology. Nessus, I just talked about De Janeiro. Nessus was the centaur that offered to drive her, to ride her across the river. Nessus is the centaur that tr attacked her and tried to rape her, and Helio Helios killed him. But Nessus now, we have De Janeiro in the birth chart. We have De Janeiro's assaulter in the crime chart. So she doesn't get away from this sexual molestation theme. It's, it's reinforced 10 times over. Nessus is prominent in this chart. Then we look at Aphrodite, and that is so important because Aphrodite is Venus, the goddess of beauty. Aphrodite, uh, in this crime chart, we have um, Sagittarius is rising, Venus is rising in Sagittarius, and Pluto is rising in Sagittarius. Plus, Aphrodite and the Venus in the chart are together. Oh, you know, I they think are, Ramsey and Venus both match each other, too, and I think simple uh, simple gematria. You know, I, I didn't you notice found that out before. Also, yeah, when we were doing um, we were doing Black Dahlia, I think I think you found that that match to to Beth Short, John Benet. Oh no, no, you know who it was? Samantha Smith with uh, the Catcher in the Rye, Robert John Bardo. Samantha Smith matched to John Benet Ramsey. I remember that. You saw that back then when we were talking about that one. Just, mm -hmm. but anyway, um, Aphrodite and Venus. Aphrodite is Venus. She's on top of the Venus planet, which is rising in the crime chart. Aphrodite's rising us. It's telling us it's about her attractiveness. She was irresistible and this got her killed, unfortunately. So, um, and that's a lot of power to have on that ascendant at that moment in time. And I cast the crime chart for the time that they called the police, which was when Patsy Ramsey found the so-called ransom note, which we know is a phony note that she wrote herself. I can even explain a little bit about that. We get off of this and onto some of the evidentiary aspects of the case. Um, so there's this strong sense of Aphrodite. And then we have, we have the Tantalus again and Arachne. And Arachne we found last night in, in the George Floyd chart about spinning a narrative. It's a, a, a spider that weaves a web. It's a person who spins a narrative. A certain narrative was spun about this case to the effect that there was an intruder broke into the home and took John Bonet down into the basement, assaulted her, and murdered her, and then sat and wrote a, a, a ransom note that would have taken at least 20 minutes to sit and compose at their kitchen table, which is idiotic. I mean, back then people were shocked by it. Now it's like we can recognize it right now for what it is. If you're going to kidnap somebody, you're going to have your note ready. If you're going to leave a note, which is dumb because it could have evidence on it, but if you're going to kidnap, you're not going to break into a house and be so disorganized that then you compose your, your note. Then you spend 20 minutes writing a two-page long note. You're going to write, have a note that says, $100,000 or the kid dies. I'll call you tomorrow. And so that there's the Arachne spinning the web of the narrative of an, of, of a, an outside job, which it was not. Now I have the... At, the underneath Arachne, Alex, and that makes me laugh. Alex Hunter was a district attorney that seemingly protected the Ramses. He, he protected them to the extent that they were indicted. Now, they were never indicted by a grand jury for murder. They were indicted by a grand jury for child neglect. And so 
that's that ran out. The statute of limitations ran out on that, so they can't even be touched now. That's why they were exonerated a couple of years ago by the new DA. But I looked up Alex Hunter. I wanted to see if Alex Hunter would turn up in the crime chart. Sure enough, he turns up in relation to law and justice. A DA, his name turns up in the, the section where you would look for legal persons. And I don't just look for that being in the chart. It has to connect to a planet, so connect to the ninth house planet. So he was somehow in on the whole deal. He was sheltering them from further investigation. Now, the last thing there to laugh at, there is actually an asteroid named Pervert. And Pervert is prominent in this crime chart, if you no, believe weird. it. It's crazy. Some of the things I started to find were crazy. I mean, people had apparently gotten, you know, they had discovered asteroids and, and named them themselves, or they sold the rights and they named them. There's a, a billion John Smith, you know, Jim Baker, all kinds of common named asteroids, which is funny because if you start looking them up in charts, sometimes they mean something. And there's a Jim Baker involved in the case. Um, so anyway, I looked up and I saw a pervert and I was like, oh boy, that does fit. It does fit because it fits with Mars. And there's something to be said about Mars in this chart. It's at the very top of the chart in the 10th house. And when we did Idaho 4, I saw a planet at the top of the chart like that, and it was telling me to look at the dog, Murphy, the dog that was uh, in, in the Idaho dorm house, dog that was protected by being locked in another room when the murders, the killings took place. So Mars is at the top of this. So I'm like, okay, what is that trying to tell me? Well, Mars is in Virgo. It's in the late degrees of Virgo. It's a really uncomfortable placement for the planet and the sign because Mars rules desire, aggression. It rules sex. It rules violence. It rules action, what we do to fulfill our desires. And it's in the sign of Virgo, the virgin. So you have this highly sexed planet in the sign of the Virgin. And when I see that in astrology, a lot of times it lends towards, it, it, not strictly, but there's a sense of kinkiness about the person. There's a sense of desire to go beyond certain boundaries of propriety. And in this case, Mars is in Virgo in this chart, in the crime chart. And also it's configured to the asteroid pervert. So I don't have to look too far to confirm that that was what was involved in this murder. Um, and now what I also see were there were three big mythological women involved in this. These were subsidiaries of the three big ones I want to talk about now. And they're all configured to John Bonet as well. The first one being Persephone which is a terrible story. Persephone was Zeus's daughter. And Zeus's brother was Hades, god of the underworld. Now, Hades had a crush on Persephone. And so Zeus was like, oh, sure, uh, I'll give you to Uncle Hades, and he can do whatever he wants with you. And that's exactly what happened. So Persephone's given to um, Hades, who abducts her, takes her to the underworld, marries her, of course, by force. And she becomes unwillingly queen of the underworld. But what happens is she, Persephone was a goddess of the harvest of grains and corn and wheat. And being underground in the underworld, she could not help the farmers. So they decided that they would keep her only over the winter months. During this, the months of growing and harvest, she would be allowed to return to the earth to help the farmers with their grain and their crops. So um, Persephone figures into John Bonet's chart as well, and it's the same kind of an idea. A young girl unwillingly given up to Uncle Hades, the molester uncle, and she's given away against her will to another older man who takes advantage of her. And that, that myth is playing out in this story. Um, the other one, the last one is Callisto. Callisto was, this is funny because they had different names for things back then. Callisto was part of this cult of women called nymphs. And the nymphs, it, it's ironic that they called them nymphs because they were practicing celibacy. They were never, they swore to never have sex. They swore to remain celibate their life long, which you think of nymphomaniac, which is the opposite. But back then a nymph was part of this cult. 
Uh, except she got seduced, uh, depending on the story, she got seduced or she got raped or something happened to her and she lost her, she lost her virginity. And that was a great disgrace. And Diana, who was the, the goddess of the cult, the, the head of this cult, was really angry that this happened to her, victim blaming again. And so she turned, and what was worse was Callisto got pregnant by this encounter. So she's pregnant, she gets, um, you know, shunned out of the cult and turned into a bear. And yet she still gives birth to a human child. But the bear, then they take pity on her and they give her, they create her into Ursa Major, which is a huge constellation in the sky. I think it's connected to the Big Dipper. So Callisto, once again, Callisto is this chaste young virgin who is seduced. Something is done against her will. She's taken against her will. And then because she's defiled, everybody's mad at her and they punish her. So one, you keep seeing this pattern in the, in the mythology of these asteroids, and it applies to Jean Benet because she was molested. She did have evidence of that in her autopsy, and there, I believe, was also evidence of that it wasn't the first time. So um, I think now that we have a sense of how she impacts her personality, her fate is impacted by all of these different stories that she's living out in modern day. I think um, when we look at the crime itself, there are certain things that I've looked at that, that give me, I have my own personal theory about it. Um, of course, it was staged. The kidnap note was written by Ram, uh, Patsy Ramsey. There were so many red flags about this that I, I don't, I don't think people really missed them. I think they weren't covered in the media for some reason, but there were so many red flags between the kidnap note and there's no real evidence of an intruder. There's no evidence of, of an entry. Um, there is a broken window, but John Ramsey admitted that he broke the window himself. So if he wanted to propagate an intruder narrative, he was going about it the wrong way. He could have said, oh, they broke that window. But he admitted to breaking the window. It would have been very difficult to get her in and out of that window anyhow. Um, but there was that part of it. Patsy Ramsey, uh, when the police arrived at 8 o'clock in the morning, Patsy Ramsey was wearing the same clothes that she wore to a party the night before. Patsy never went to bed. What was she doing all night? She was up spinning the narrative. She was up figuring out what to write in the, the, the ransom note. There were so many red flags. I mean, you could have had a communist parade with all the red flags that were coming up with all this, these different, you know, bogus events that they claimed. And there's, um, there's like a Russian airport. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so the thing that stuck with me, and it's in this chart, and it is, it's just brilliant how these charts reflect things on so many levels. I have talked about Mars and Virgo at the top of the chart. Mars rules pineapples. And Virgo rules the stomach in the human body. There was undigested pineapple bits in John Benet's stomach at autopsy. Now, at the top of this chart, it's telling me, look at that, look at that, look at that the way I looked at the dog in Idaho 4. Look at that. Okay, so what the autopsy report said was the... Without chemical testing, the medical examiner, who actually was, let's see, Lisa, for your records, John Meyer, I believe. I don't know if you read, ran across John Meyer in Boulder, no, Colorado. I okay, done. okay. I, was just I will definitely the, look into him. What, yeah, I wanted to, I was wondering about that. The medical examiner recognized pineapple shreds without benefit of chemical analysis. Therefore, that is telling me that she ate, and she liked pineapples and milk. It was a snack that she liked to have. So she ate, had eaten pineapples within two hours of her death because it takes about two hours for carbohydrates like fruit and vegetables to digest. It takes just about two hours, give or take. So we have an idea of a timeline which I was trying to narrow down. I didn't look at the timeline at the Ramsey house. I'm looking at what happened to her before that. Because they went to a party on Christmas night at 5 o'clock in the evening, and they were there till 10 o'clock. 
somewhere at that point, and I wish to God that they would have interviewed people at the party, and I wish they would have asked them, what did John Bonet eat at that party, and when did she eat it? Because it's a clue to when she was murdered. So apparently if they went to the party and let's say they had dinner and let's say she had pineapple for dessert and let's say it was around eight o'clock at night, I'm, I'm guessing, but I'm just for the sake of the timeline trying to figure out what is the, that evidence telling us. Let's say she ate that pineapple around six, seven o'clock. Well, then she's dead by nine or 10. And my theory of this whole case is that when John Ramsey brought her home wrapped in a blanket, asleep, and put her to bed, she was already dead. That's what I think. Because if you back up some of the other factors, like when the police showed up and they didn't find her in the Ramsey basement, which, by the way, nobody knew that room existed. You would have to know that house intimately to know that that little room where she was sequestered even existed. It was The, the, it, the house was a maze of different weird rooms, it was an old Tudor house. By the way, I have seen photographs of the interior of that house. And the kitchen was white and black checkerboard Masonic pattern. Now, I don't know how much we can take from that, but that was there. I'm just saying. Anyway, there were a lot of weird room this, rooms in that house, weird rooms in the basement. And the people didn't know that room was even existed. It was usually, usually kept locked. She's found in that room. Whoever put her in there knew exactly where that room was. Anyway, so she's found in that room at 1 o'clock the following afternoon, and she already is giving off the odor of decomposition. Now, that's very telling because you don't give off that odor right away. You don't start to give off that odor till maybe the later part of the first 24 hours. And it was cold. It was December. John Ramsey drove her home in a car. He has her kept her on the ice-cold basement floor of a basement for hours and hours. So I don't know how much that might have slowed the decomp. But if they smelled decomp at one o'clock in the afternoon, that's putting her death possibly way beyond what they thought was after midnight. For some reason, I think they thought it was midnight, one in the morning, whatever. Um, so that's suspicious to me that there was the odor of, of, of decomp on her and it makes the timeline a lot more shaky. Um, I think also with the pineapple and also the fact that the cause of death was this, there was this eight and a half inch crack in her, the right side of her skull running from front to back, which they believe disabled her, but she was also uh, strangled. There was ligature strangulation with petechiae in the eyes and face and a mark of a garage, a tightly tied lig ligature around her neck. But also the blow to the skull contributed to that because I believe it knocked her out. But that was, that was a contributing factor to her, to her death. And it makes sense. She was a rambunctious child. I don't think for a minute she was going to put up with being molested. Somebody whacked her over the head. It's like, uh-oh, now what do we do? And... Um, finished her off with a, a, a makeshift garrote, which as the handle of it was one of Patsy Ramsey's paintbrushes, which had also been used to molest John Bonet. They found some DNA on the handle of that. And she had abrasions to her vagina and her vag vaginal area. And there were, there were stains on the, on the leggings that she was wearing, pink stains, uh, suggestive of blood. It was also suggestive of having been wiped, that whole area having been wiped off, washed off. So the blow to the head, they said, was two and a half, I don't know how they know this, but the blow to the head was about two and a half hours prior to her death. So you have to figure it now. She's eaten pineapple. She dies within two hours of that. She, right away after that, must have been struck on the head. So, you, again, you're getting a timeline of early to mid-evening, just on that basis. The final thing about the pineapple that I want to talk about, because Mars rules pineapples and it was in her stomach, one of the major pieces of evidence which propagated the false narrative of an intruder was that there was a bowl of pineapples and milk on the kitchen counter with a big soup spoon in it. 
And they said, John and Patsy Ramsey said, well, we don't remember giving her that. We didn't give her that. That must have been the intruder, which is so foolish to think that somebody who's kidnapping a kid is going to take the time to feed it in the house before they kill her and then spend a half hour writing a, a ransom note. It, it's so idiotic when you when you examine that narrative. Anyway, the, the dead giveaway to me was the pineapple bowl because John Bonet did like pineapples and milk, and that's what the bowl contained. However, the bowl and the spoon only contained Patsy Ramsey's fingerprints. John Bonet ate a bowl of pineapple. Her fingerprints and DNA would have been all over that. It's a messy snack. It's like eating cereal. It's, the milk is dripping and everything. It's, she's a little, she's a six-year-old kid. How on earth does she even reach into a cupboard to get a bowl to have pineapple and milk in the middle of the night? So I believe that Patsy's fingerprints being on that bowl is telling us Patsy put that out on purpose. She must have been smart enough and shrewd enough to know that when John Bonet ate pineapple at that party, we better put it out like she ate it here. That would have been a very shrewd move on Patsy's part, but I think she was a pretty smart lady. So I think that, that she, John Bonet never came into the kitchen and ate pineapple. I think that was put, a, put out to further the narrative of an intruder. What I think happened, whatever on earth, whoever was at this party, something on really untoward happened. I don't know, following the myth, how com compliant was John Ramsey and having his daughter subject to this kind of violation by other men? What was going on? He was at, with Access Graphics. They had just reached the billion-dollar mark in sales. They became a very affluent company, eventually bought out by Lockheed Martin. They were on the rise. Who was he associating with? What were the terms? What was he aspiring to do? And for what price was he willing to pay? That run People that run in these circles are always trading horrendous favors for other types of favors. Okay, and John Bonet was a very desirable commodity. In fact, another there's another asteroid I didn't put in there. The title of the asteroid is Desiderata, someone who was wildly desired. I mean, I couldn't fit them all in. There were just so many jumping out at me from these charts. So I think there's reason to suspect that something happened. When she was brought home, I can see a scenario where something happens at this party. It's like, Oops, John, listen, okay, now it's your problem. You got to deal with this. We're not dealing with this. You got to deal with this. We want you in on an XYZ deal. You take care of this for us. So John is now, and Patsy are now responsible for dealing with the kid. Because if you think of it, if Burke Ramsey accidentally killed her, they could just call an ambulance. They could call the police. I'm sure it wouldn't have been such a big deal, such a big disgrace to have the son... You know, look, it, it was an accident, and maybe they would have looked the other way. Certainly, the DA was very, very gracious with them as it was. And the situation was even worse than that. But if Burke had done it, I don't see the motive for going to these lengths to cover it up. There was this was somebody else was involved, and it's like, you know, dude, this is your problem. You got to take care of it yourself. We're, we wash our hands of it. You better not talk. Do we know where you live? Kind of a deal. So. That being said, looking at the chart with the pineapple pointing me in that direction and the false scenario, the false scenarios created, it's not hard for me to imagine that when they brought her home, she was already dead. And they spent the entire night, excuse me, constructing this because Patsy was wearing the same clothes. And John Bonet was wearing party clothes. She wasn't wearing pajamas, even though they said they put her to bed asleep. You'd think you would change the child before you put them to bed. She's wearing heavy clothes. You don't need heavy clothes. You don't need to be wearing leggings in bed when there's tons of blankets on your bed. So I just think that there was somebody else. I then, So it takes me away from thinking that the family did it, but the family certainly is guilty. They are certainly complicit. They are certainly involved. And as the her birth chart promised, they would not protect her. They didn't protect her. They're guilty of certain other things. Uh, so I have to think back in the, to my original thoughts. First, I thought they didn't do it. Then I thought they did it. Now I'm thinking they're complicit. They're as guilty as if they did it. But um, 
there are some other questions surrounding John's other son, John Bennett. His whereabouts during this time are a little bit suspicious. And the fact that the ransom note said, um, we want $118,000, an odd amount, but that was the amount of his bonus. So maybe they're trying to attach it to his bonus. But they asked for $100,000 in $100 bills and $18,000 in $20 bills. So it's like, what's going on with these numbers? Hundred thousand and eighteen, eleven and eight, one and eighteen. What's going on with that? That's kind of suspicious. And then they also identified themselves. We are a small foreign faction. What is that about? Trying to distract away from probably a group of corporate investors, maybe, in his company. And um, in in the note, there are several things that Patsy would say. It was part of her. It was some of her slang. One of the things in the note she said was, use some of your Southern common sense, John. John's not Southern. He's from Nebraska. That is what somebody who is Southern would say. Patsy was a Southern belle. She's saying, use your Southern common sense, because she relates to that. That's her own background. So I think Patsy was a dead ringer for the, the writer of the note. And um, just going to show that it was an elaborately staged deal. I don't know to what extent they did some of these horrible things with the evidence that was found. She was like tied and stuff, duct taped. And I imagine that they went that far, whatever the threat was, was that big to them worth taking that kind of a risk. And as we know, they got away with it. We still don't know who did this. You know, one thing I do want to mention just real quick. Uh, I don't know what made me like really. Well, I do know what made me think about it. But you mentioned what the ransom was, what, $118,000? $118, $118,000, yep. I don't know why, but like, one eight, well, yeah, 118 stuck out of my head because uh, I remembered epithelium equals 118. <laughs> it's simple. Um, you wow. know, certain certain parts of the eye, like I will, I do like remember from looking at it a lot. Um, so like I went over to like I and I do have it's on the occult research institute dot org actually. Um, I did run like ridiculous amount of numbers on like parts of the eye, and you could see like the matches and just the numerical value. Very interesting stuff, you know, occultism, occult, the eye. There mm -hmm. might be something there. Um, and I just happened to notice, like, I pulled it up on, like, the thing that I, I even did. And, like, there is, I mean, sacrificial lamb, poisoning, elementary, rainbow child, queen Isis. I mean, you even get yeah. some interesting things matching that 118. Yeah. Bride of Christ in Hebrew. And uh, besides that, one thing I did want to mention that, I mean, I, I hate to say, it, you know, d due to this, I even, like, wonder what's up with this case. And I hate to say it, you know. I know, I don't know what it is, uh, you know, just when it comes to true crime, for some reason, I know this isn't a popular thing to do, for some reason, people just like, oh, the family is just automatically innocent. I, I don't know where that comes from, but that seems to happen a lot, but like, in my opinion, if you're getting Lynn Wood as a lawyer mm -hmm. for an anti-defamation case, considering things that he's been involved with in the, before that and after... Yeah. You got yeah. you had a character right there, and in yes, my opinion, he was you had a big, to. He's a big Trump mouthpiece. You, you had to, the beginning of Trump of Trump's reign. Yeah, you had to think yeah. about it too. He had there was a certain amount of political people or Lynn was a lawyer that really kept the whole idea of Q alive with Trump because yeah. you're like, oh, you got a famous lawyer. You have Michael Flynn, who is in the government. You have all these people that are known actually saying Q that are being taking pictures with Trump. In my opinion, Linwood's an occultist, and he's there to string the story and build it. He's, he's one of the people that is bringing you the illusion of what's going on. That's my mm -hmm. opinion with him and Trump and QAnon. So was there any difference when he was with the family? I'm here to keep this look untarnished about these people he's there mm -hmm. to create an image he's doing it again he's a magician he's an occultist yeah i think i think also if he because i believe the father had like the chat is saying 
And I, I had read that too, that he had ties with a private contractor. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it is in the best interest of those private contractors to give you a lawyer to make sure that no bad publicity comes mm -hmm. to you as well as the company you are employed by. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it's like, don't worry about it. We'll get you a lawyer. You know, the mm -hmm. company stands behind you because it stands to gain if you don't drag their name through the mud as well, in my opinion. I mean, I, I don't know. I've, I have no, this is kind of just secondhand, secondhand information. One of the things that I thought was interesting that, that a lot of people do not mention is that uh, nine months later, after the Ramsey, John Benet Ramsey incident happened, there was another little girl that was assaulted a few houses down. And the same MO happened. Um, nothing ever came of that. And I believe uh, the little girl was a little older than John Bonet, but they were in the same dance club, dance studio mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. you. And so um, it just seems like it was so nicely, you know, packaged, swept under the rug, and nothing ever became of it. In fact, I think the family moved away or something like that. But again, I, the, to your point about um, the, the, the letter writing, I believe I remember them saying that how um, it was lengthy. I mean, who writes a lengthy rent and rent? I'm just not that I ever did, but it's, it's one of those where it's like more, more, less is more, right. I would mm -hmm, think, mm -hmm. but the actual, um, the paper and the pen used came from inside the house. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then um, that the actual, um, what's it called? The There was practice writing that was found on the actual letter. Like somebody had tried to practice writing it on another piece of paper. Oh, yeah, there was an impression of the, the imprint yeah. of, the, of the pen, yeah. Who has time to practice writing? Well, she had, Patsy had, all, you know? Patsy had all night I mean, long. <laughs> no, but exactly. Yeah. That's my yeah. point. And then yeah. it, it's just this, you know, strung together situation where, you know, you were going to have time because you were the one that was going to call the 911. Yeah. And that, you know, you have a missing kid. I don't know. It, it seemed um, it seemed odd. And I, I will insert my theory. I was telling Nick prior to the thing. I think the brother did it. I mean, I always have felt that way. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that is what happened. I just had always since the very beginning when you heard the story and then what have you. Um, but it, it was very interesting. The actual um, the ligature that's used uh, with the, the broken paintbrush end um, and how you know, the, to me, that indicated that you would need leverage. And why would you need leverage? If you're an older man and this is a six-year-old little child, what leverage do you, you know what I mean? Why, why would you need a leverage? Yo, you if know, a guy you, needs you know, leverage to do that to a six-year-old child, how is he even breaking into a house? I mean, come on. I mean, you, you could, you could I, do that probably just by like grabbing, picking up a cup. And squeezing it. I mean, yeah. I mean, I just, you know. And I get it's probably a torturous, you know, situation or what have you. Maybe that's what it was. Uh, in my mind, it made it made it sense that it would be it would be the, the brother, right? Because he's small. Um, yeah, because like I had other, even said to you, Gacy used that because he was using men that were in shape that he had to worry about overpowering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing that I had heard, and I don't know how true this was and I never followed up on it, but wasn't, uh, wasn't there, um, like taser marks? There were, on the there trail? were taser, there were marks on her throat and chest area that were initially were considered to be taser marks. Then somebody else came along with the theory because it didn't fit certain taser guns. The, the measurements were different. Somebody else, and I don't know how true this is, but the guy wrote a book about it. People were starting to spin their own narratives about the crime after a bit. But he said that the dimension, the, the distance between the the marks equaled the same, was equidistant to a train tracks that Burke Ramsey had in that basement for Christmas trains. That and that he he theorized that he was torturing her with it. He was sticking it into her. Then somebody else came along and said, oh, no, that fits XYZ stun gun. So it was inconclusive in my view. I, I didn't know what to make of it. But, you know, Werner Spitz did this whole reexamination of the case, and he named Burke as the likely suspect after examining all the evidence. And the Ramsey sued the pants off of him and CBS. 
because Werner Spitz did this on TV. But I don't know how how any of that, the validity of any of that, just to your point, that, that they did consider that, and he did believe that Burke did it. And then they got sued, and Burke won the case. So they had to settle out of court. I, I wonder but, if um, I wonder if that was Linwood. I don't know. Them. It's very possible that it was it was the brother. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, again, um, this this is this has always been an extremely fascinating case, and the fact that these asteroids pretty much describe, you know, it to a T, like what is in the actual you know reporting as well is that to me is. And even with how it describes some of the stuff with uh, Smiley Face, I mean, it was right on point. I mean, these, yeah. I think, these are like a measuring marks where, you know, if this is true for this one, the validity for this one, the odds are that it could be as well to me. Um, but it's just, yeah, I, such a sad situation. I think from now on, I mean, I avoided the asteroids for years. I just like, oh, I want to master the 10 planets before I take, start taking on hundreds and hundreds of asteroids. But now that I've gotten into it and, and dove in head first, I, they're indispensable to my work now. It's like I don't, could not imagine working without them. Um, just because in crimes, you're, you're looking for information. You're looking for specifics. You're looking for detail. And they're so revealing, and at, at least even... A human on a human behavior level. I mean, here's a young, beautiful young golden girl, princess girl, a goddess. She's a little goddess. And these men lust after her and somebody actually finally got to her. And the father didn't protect her either, which was that Le the Elizabeth Short Black Dahlia theme. And I, looking at this, I forgot to mention, there's a ton of Capricorn again, which we keep seeing Capricorn, Idaho Force, smiley face. Last night I talked about Capricorn. Capricorn in the tarot is the devil. It is giving in to temptation. It is big business. It is government. It is hierarchy of all institutions. And there in that second house, like the lower left, you see a bunch of planets. They represent John Binet and her environment, and it's all Capricorn. And that's why I thought it must have tied into the father's business somehow. So there's the Capricorn, the devil, the goat, the goat and the devil. It's the, the, the abyss or the, the, the heights, you know, as I talked about in, in another show. It keeps coming up. It's like I'm at the point where I expect to see Capricorn in these crime charges. So much more of these cases, you keep peering behind the curtain. Big business, lots of money, favors yeah. changing hands among people in power. And even I mean, ugly practices, lewd practices, even, you know, trafficking, even money no. laundering. The Capricorn is the um, the goat, right? Yeah. And so you have Ram, Ramsey. Mm -hmm. and that's always kind of mm -hmm. got me when you first said it. I was like, I was going to yell it out, but I was like, no, wait. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, that it's it just so telling. Yep. I love it. It paints a picture. It's, it's it's beautiful. You're really looking at. Well, I always look at the, the the charts. They're like a stage, and and the planets are all the actors and the characters. And then you have to figure out what is the what is the activity, what is the drama at play, who are the characters, mm -hmm. what are they doing, and how are they doing right. it, and what's the result. And that's kind of how I look at it. It's more like it's a story because it's a story told in a language of symbols. Mm. And all I'm doing is interpreting the, the, this. La I'm an interpreter of a language. That's all I am, really. I'm interpreting what these symbols represent. And these symbols go back into antiquity, and they have tremendous impact on the human psyche and the collective consciousness. Yes. You know what I, I, I have said, and, uh, you know, I have even, me and Lisa have even started wondering it with certain things that we've come across just with like playing with Jamatri and certain parts of the body, eyes and blood, you know, stuff like that. Um, when you start seeing like certain God names or even just certain like commonalities start like popping up in certain like areas of the body and gods, you almost start to wonder, like, I do think is a good possibility that um, some of these stories of when these gods are like going through battles or something's going on or there's a change happening I do think sometimes, as crazy as it sounds, they were actually showing you like hidden science and these symbols and these gods and this art is actually like 
showing you like change with inside your body, like something to do with the way your vision is. I think, believe it or not, even your blood, I think you will actually see stories that is just representing like your blood taking form and everything flowing through it and things attaching. And that sounds crazy, but you know, I have mm-hmm. wondered if some of these gods are really just like an occult way. And again, like, you know, I've even said myself, if you have a magical experience, there's, there's not enough words or even an image that could ever portray what you're really trying to express. Because in this, just my, my experience in this reality, you're lost for words. You can't like, you know how yeah. they say you can't even, if you can't understand God, then how do you, how can you even explain it? So I'm like, unless you have an experience and across the abyss, like, first off, you'll never really truly understand other art, in my opinion, unless you have that experience. But like, you can never even fully express it in the English language because you're trying to explain something that, in my opinion, as we know, it shouldn't even exist. You know, or we it's, haven't it's existed. Beyond, it's beyond description. Yeah, it's beyond yeah. definition. It's in the ether somewhere. We're just trying to grab at it. And I'd know? even wonder if that's... That's reasons for difference of languages. Because there oh, is yeah. some languages that I do think would be better at explaining certain things. Mm-hmm. But then the oh, English think, language absolutely. will lack it. You know what absolutely. I'm saying? Like like Greek. Yes. You, they'll have so many different words for a different thing. But yes. like English has like three or four. So like makes yeah. it limited. Mm-hmm. Fair, yeah. But I, I, I do think uh, you will get a lot of stories like that. Uh, I know it's crazy that sounds. That was a little bit of a tangent off topic. but No, but to your point about the medical, I mean... I haven't done this yet. I know it vaguely. There is a branch of astrology, of medical astrology, which is mind-blowing. For example, I know a little bit. I know that Mars, you know, represented pineapple, which is not medical astrology, but Virgo rules the stomach, so she had pineapple in her stomach. There's a whole branch of astrology where these all have symbols of parts of the body and functions of the body. And doctors... People complain about the Middle Ages. They say people were ignorant. These people were brilliant. They were the most well-educated of people ever on the face of the earth. If you were a doctor, you automatically knew astronomy. You were trained in astrology. Doctors used astrology to diagnose and treat patients because there's a whole section of astrology where everything rules a particular herb. So if you know those connections and those rulerships, you can figure out what herb this person needs. What the doctors did, which fascinates me, when I have dabbled with some medical stuff, astrology, when he went to the doctor, he didn't sit and write on a pad or type on a computer. He took cast a chart for the moment you showed up. And on the basis of that chart, he would diagnose what your ailment was. And that's how that worked. And it did work if you knew what you were doing. That's always the key to this stuff because it's so complex. But they would look at it because they looked at it. uh, Elements represent four basic humors of the body. There were four four elements. If you those, I don't even want to try to say what they were. But there were there's sanguine, um, melancholic. There's two more. I I forget what they are. But they they, something like that. Yeah, I can't remember the other two. Everything boiled down to then the planet means something else. Then the sign means something else. And then if the moon was here, it meant this. If the moon was here, it meant that. It is so hard to read. I have a lot of these old texts. I've collected them, but it is they're not bedtime reading. It is so hard to read them because it's like if the moon is here and if the moon is there and if the moon and if Mars conjuncts this and if this is in the, I mean, you go nuts with the ifs. You have to learn the conditions. But what I'm saying is they were educated and knowledgeable enough that they could do medical work, the work of a physician with an astrology horoscope, and they would know how to treat it. Basically, it was uh, most treatments were relegated to herbs because that's what you had but they knew how to combine herbs. They understood alchemy. They knew how to make things out of other things. And they would see that in the chart too. So, and astrology was so connected to ritual magic. They were inseparable back then. Well, one thing I would like to even add real quick. I'm sorry, Lisa. Hopefully I'm not stealing your thunder. I mean, to a certain extent, when it comes out, when it comes up to stuff out in the sky, I don't know if people understand this, but... When it comes to the way we think we're positioned in whatever's out there, and a lot of the things that we were told that is out there in these names came from occultists and alchemists. Mm-hmm. I, and I don't know, you know, people seem to just not know that or forget, but like, you. so in my opinion, you need to question what was even coming out of these people's mouths if they tell you this stuff. 
-hmm. or how it was presented, or do you really understand what they're telling you? But keep that in mind. Our our ideas of what's out there, our known alchemists mm -hmm. and our occultists told us, mm -hmm. they have defined where we are in this universe. <laughs> What I was going to say was that uh, we covered one of the grimoires called, I think, I'm going to totally murder it here, uh, I, Iositron, I, Iacitron or something like that. Anyway, it was a Greek grimoire. And when you look into it, um, it was a collection of practices that they would include all of the astrology of the charts of what it was associated with, with, you know, whether it was different parts of the body, anatomy, physiology. It also would talk about aliments or anything to do with like when you were born or when the, the aliment started and what you should do and when you should do it. It also covered herbs. It covered mm -hmm. different places of, of when it happened. They included not only medical texts from actual medical uh, facilities, or I guess you would call them hospitals back then. Not you would call them hospitals back then, but you would call them something back then. And then they would also, alongside that, include what some of the folk medicine, along with some of these, um, I guess, you know, um, I don't call them witch doctors, we call them curanderos here but you know what i mean in back then in the greek right back words are failing me for some reason today but um they would include all of the information in these books so that you had a total 360 of knowledge for mm -hmm. that one aliment not only were you looking at astrology you were looking at the actual the four that you mentioned but you were also looking at herbs you were also looking at what the local uh, folklore was at the mm -hmm. time And all of this was important, and they considered it all important in order to treat one ailment. Um, so yes, mm -hmm. these, these people were were extremely learned, and they were polymaths, and they were um, including mm -hmm. all kinds of information into these things because it was all important. Yeah, it was remarkable. I mean, they they knew Latin, they knew Greek, they they knew math, they knew astrology, they they knew everything. They didn't have computers. They didn't even have libraries. If you wanted to learn something, you had to go to the city where the person was teaching it, basically, before right. the printed word. So, I mean, I'm in awe of the, the early astrologers, and that's why I study what they said. It's never changed. Um, it's, it's always proven to be true, and I, I just sometimes look at it and try to apply it like I was looking at. Um, for a time, I was actually some years ago was studying catastrophes. What What happens in a plane crash? Well, mm -hmm. they used they didn't have planes in the day, but they had elaborate texts on when not to sail a ship. Yes, they do. Okay. And so I started looking at, well, a, a, a ship, it's an airship. An airplane's an airship. Maybe it applies to a flight. And it was bearing out. I took a bunch of data about plane crashes, and I, it was bearing out to work the same And one of the uh, one of the aphorisms was never ever set sail when the moon is rising, and I think in one of the really famous plane crashes, I don't remember it was the one um, over Brazil, I don't remember Pan Am something years ago. The moon was rising. Of course, there are other things in the chart. It's not just one element. You have to be extremely careful. But if this and and that, and if this and that, all these conditions. And I, I have such faith in that. It's like, well, nobody's come along to contradict or change any of this. It's, it's knowledge. It's always come down from antiquity to us. And what business do we have trying to contest it? I'm trying to prove it most of the time because it's so apropos to daily life. Yeah, agreed. agreed. But, yeah, that's pretty fascinating stuff. Yep. Yep. Great. Yeah. So, unless there's any questions, um, I think I pretty much covered what I had to say. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I think that was good. Yeah, I think there's uh, so many things with this. Just oh, yeah. I will, I will say one thing, because remember, BD, when we covered the Black Dahlia, you were talking about, oh, no, no, when, well, that one too, but when we covered the nurses being killed in Chicago and you oh, talked yeah, about oh, yeah. how, mm -hmm. how it changed the the persona of people like before that people were not locking their front doors you know everybody mm -hmm. was kind of trusted mm -hmm. you know in their and then after some of these things happen it changes this the the actual public psyche in that you start to behave differently 
And so now in my mind, when, when John Bonet happened, obviously I was, you know, cognizant of it. Um, and it happens on Christmas to me, I felt like it was another like onslaught onto the public psyche in that we're going to traumatize these people about something horrific when in a time when you're supposed to be happy Mm -hmm. together with Mm -hmm. family celebrating joyous peaceful we're going to insert this into the the public um, zeitgeist so to speak yeah I, i think a lot of the choice of of crimes to be catapulted into the national uh media spectacle is what chord can we most viciously strike at in the person's emotional makeup a beautiful little girl she's also a pageant queen she's a beautiful golden girl she's pretty she sings she dances i mean uh, these things are carefully chosen because look at what happened the girl down the street a few months later that didn't go like john bonnet we people still know still ask about john bonnet to this day that was what going on 30 years ago 28 years ago um, which is significant, actually, that I say that because that is a cycle. 28 years is a Saturn cycle. And I wonder, 1996 to 2024, I wonder if something significant isn't going to come out in the next year about Jean Benet. Because during a Saturn cycle, things get revived. I see it in oh, time and again and again. Yes, time and again. It's either seven years, 14 years, much less infrequently 21 years but 28 years is huge saturn cycle um natalie wood she drowned they reopened her investigation of her drowning and the saturn return year anniversary and i covered that when i was i was just learning crime astrology then i wrote about that back then and they're still trying to figure out i mean they know who did it her husband did it for god's sake but um but these things happen in cycles, and astrologically, that, that bears out. And now you're going to start you're just seeing a lot on TV of things that happened in the early 90s or the mid-90s because you're coming up to that 28 to 30-year Saturn cycle. Mm-hmm. So if you notice that, I said I notice stuff like that all the time because I'm aware of it, and I see it. I watch a lot of crime, true crime stuff. And I notice there's cycles. Something happened. Oh, it happened 14 years ago. Oh, it happened 28 years ago. So these things do cycle around, and they do come into public awareness. I'm real interested with the spec case because this summer is the second Saturn cycle of that case. I wonder if any, there's not going to be an anniversary. They won't do that till it's like uh, be the 60th or something. But I'm real. I'm, I'm keeping my finger on the pulse of Chicago just to see if that comes up because that's a two two Saturn cycle. Although people consider that case closed. But I hope they discover my book, and then they'll they might think twice. Hopefully, <laughs> you know uh, something I wanted to bring up that Lisa kind of touched on, even with like the whole thing of I guess uh, I guess putting out fear in a sense mm-hmm. onto the zeitgeist. Uh, that's even, in my opinion, another thing with Lynn Wood. He, uh, I, you know, he even was on the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Oh wow! Now, That's right. now, I, I remember, and you know, this was another thing that I thought was rather weird, and I'm pretty sure, pretty sure a lot of it was authentic, but I'm sure there was a lot out there that was probably meant to like really just get anxiety, <laughs> hate, and fear going. But like, when there was a lot of these protests and riots, there was tons of like people actually like live streaming this shit, you know? Yeah. And like, yeah. I even want to be totally honest with you, and I've even tried doing this on my end as a podcast or a content creator. It is very hard to actually live stream high quality video unless like you've got something <laughs> along with you. And so like I, I can't even with what I have stream out just randomly out in the streets like I was looking at then years ago. Um, which I just want to throw that in there. I find that very interesting now since I'm much more technical with this stuff. Uh, you know, it's, I can't even pull it off unless I want to start carrying shit with me to put it that way. Um you know, you got a lot of these videos, all these riots, a lot of shit. It was just like all over the place, especially on like alternative media sites. I can't even remember, Cloud Hub and some other one. Just like really weird, shitty ones that started popping up and all the censorship was coming on, around. And, uh, you know, I actually, I'm pretty sure if it wasn't live, it was at least a few hours later, I saw that Kyle Rittenhouse shit happen. And believe it or not, it was probably four or five days before it blew up on the internet, which I was actually surprised about. 
Because I was like, yo, I literally watched some kid pop two dudes. Like, you literally watched him shoot people. Yeah. And then goes up to the cops and puts his hands up and tells him what they did, and they drive away. That made no fucking sense at all. Yeah. And in some sense, I do think that that situation in itself was to get people going at that time. Because at that time, there was a lot of hate brewing. Um, you know, a lot of the whole, not that I'm denying it, but um, you, you did get like a whole lot of hate going for pedos. Kyle Rittenhouse happened to shoot mm -hmm. a pedo. You know what I'm saying? It's just, you know, there was a lot of yeah, things yeah. Just at that time yeah. that fit very Q-esque, in my opinion, yeah. to yep. get emotions going and to think you got to start picking teams. Shit's getting serious out there. <laughs> <laughs> just know, like, in three towns that you'll never visit in your life. <laughs> it's, it's ironic how we get a tool that we begin to think it could be helpful, like the internet, like video, like television. But as soon as the the beneficial properties are discovered, somebody comes along, finds a, a nefarious way to exploit the very same things, like video anymore, you really can't trust. We used to think, oh, they got it on video. You really can't trust that now. Like we talked last night about Derek Chauvin kneeling with his hand in his pocket for nine and a half minutes. I looked at that, but the guy is posing. He's posing. He keeps staring at the camera. It didn't look like a natural posture. George Floyd, like just also the head of George Floyd not moving. I thought, is that real? I mean, you get to the point where what we tr want to trust as real becomes illusion, becomes manipulated. It falls into that arachne, uh, you know, mm -hmm. area of being uh, spun as a narrative. You know, like a yeah. spider spinning a web. And so you have these wonderful... I remember when TV was so promising. It's an educational tool. You know, it's a bunch of crap. I mean, so much garbage. It's a money-making garbage machine. And yet, in the beginning, things have always have this promise, like the spring. Before spring goes into summer and fall and decay. Then, then people get a hold of it and start messing with it. And it seems to be the way of anything... Uh, any benefit to the earth you have to grab it in the beginning because it's going to get compromised and it's just the way things are but i, I look at video now it's like i i'm not sure i'm even seeing what I'm, I'm seeing what i'm supposed to be seeing but what i am i seeing is is what i am seeing real i don't know anymore i, I think it, it pushes you to a point where you have to just really start to trust yourself and your own judgment your own discernment because a lot of these things, once they figure out, oh, the internet, we can manipulate mass consciousness with the internet, which was a, a, a communication tool at first, and then an mm -hmm. educational tool, and now it's a mass manipulation tool. So yeah, all those I, I things, actually, it, it, it started with, we were starting to mention video, but it's like all these things get caught in that web of nefarious, you know, activity. And it's just funny. It's funny. You have to just constantly be vigilant. Of what yeah. you're paying attention to. I, I even question, you know, even Kyle Rittenhouse. Mm -hmm. I question that whole situation because it, it is very weird. I mean, if you just look at it in a cultist sense, I mean, like he was wearing green and he had blue gloves on. So, like, now that's already the right side pillar. So that's, like, just extreme energy. You know what I'm saying? And then, like, he's got a gun and, like, you know, that could be, like, a representative for the archer, you know, in a sense. He shot two people and killed them. That could be the twins, you know, when you start getting on tarot cards. And when it came for him to approach the power and the glory, the red sphere and the blue sphere, he seemed to have, I guess, had his own law because they just drove off and they let him pass. <laughs> so as an occultist, it's very interesting to watch what happened. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> It makes you wonder how because deliberate it, certain things are. I mean, when things yeah. fall into a pattern, it, it really that's the fascination for me is, is this, how deliberate is this if this is, in fact, deliberate? Is it deliberate at all? Is it maybe a little bit and then it, it developed its own life? I, I, that's the fascination of a cult with me sometimes, reading the symbols. You know, and things could have happened. Like, for instance, we have the John Bonet, and then nine months later, we have Amy, who was the little girl, right? Amy wasn't really publicized. Jean Benet right. was. Right. How many times do we have we have a smiling face killer situation? Nothing was being publicized. Now all of a sudden it's being publicized. I think the picking and choosing 
is deliberate. I oh, think yeah. picking and choosing of the right. crimes themselves mm-hmm. to insert mm-hmm. the faces mm-hmm. of the mm-hmm. people sitting in front of their television or their phone, that is for sure deliberate. The actual event, I, mean, I could say it's anybody's guess. It could be and it could be, but I, but I feel that the media's selection of what is traumatizing the people is deliberate. You know, and the crazy thing is, if you really think about it, and listen, I mean, I've made, I've even brought it up, and I did say this is sometimes why I actually, like, and we're doing true crime right now, why I would, like, never push it hard, hard, especially I would never even monetize myself if I was doing it. Um, it's just, I do think that, like, um, they are, some of them are pushed for a specific reason. Like you were saying, I really do think that some of them have... Uh, there's reasons for the, the, I don't know how to explain it, but I just I think it is to push the psyche, you know, in certain directions. Well, especially when it has the power of the myth behind it, like you would expect Princess Diana is going to have a nice rule and she's going to queen and, and then it's a horrible accident happens and she's with her lover that she's trying to find happiness with after being treated like dirt by Charles and she's horribly killed. And this death of a princess thing, which is why I wanted to, to name the show that, is it, co- it connects to our collective consciousness of tragedy of these young girls, even Black Dahlia and the murder of the young girls in Los Angeles. She was another young girl, went to seek fame and fortune quite innocently, ends up being horribly butchered. Um, that tweaks a nerve in, in, the, in the population, mm-hmm. especially in women who I think a lot of times are the intended targets. Although men are too in a different way, but it, it's just... There's always a purpose because they weren't even going to cover Black Dahlia until somebody called the newspaper and said, don't let go of Black Dahlia. I'm going to mail you some of her her uh, clothing. And only then did it become what it became. It was just another girl getting bumped off is what the police thought. She thought they thought she was just a tramp who got got in somebody's way. So it is the choice, uh, and that's what the media has that power to pick and choose what they put out there, and they have every every handle on the intent behind it and the likely effect of it. This, and the, but as, yeah. as for the, the circumstances themselves, that's a little different. Why do certain numbers turn up? Why is something happening on a given day? Why mm-hmm. are colors turning up? Why are shapes turning up? That's a little bit more subject to discussion sometimes, I think. Yes. You you know, one, thing, one thing I was going to say, and I had a brain fart, and that's why I kind of stopped what I was saying. One of the reasons why, I, I, like I was saying about like not sticking to true crime as heavy, at as mm-hmm. one point I wanted to get into it, is because I did start noticing, I mean, besides like you start pimping death and real horrible situations to like get clicks and I guess notoriety, you know, or get seen, um... I have noticed, and it's very weird, and, like, this even goes kind of back to even Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, you have, people start to love, like, certain images. If you, like, listen, mm-hmm. I know it's, listen, it, it could have been justified with what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse or that whole situation, but you had people, like, loving the fact that he just popped two motherfuckers in front of you and you got to watch it. People lusted that shit. People will lust the victims. People will lust family members. Okay. And mm-hmm. the crazy mm-hmm. thing is, is that, you know, I'm, you know, I know I say this a lot, but, like, another thing is, it's, like, what I'm getting at is, like, are they doing this so they could even, like, so let's see what happens and if this works. You have people that, like, based off of, like, maybe a, a minute or two minutes of seeing somebody talk on TV, you think you know them, and you fell in love with them. Mm-hmm. So, like, really, I'm going to be totally honest, that's almost like black magic because now you decided to play yeah. God. You're playing God because you're creating that person in your image because you don't know them. You've created them in your image. You've deemed them to be innocent because they said something or dressed a nice way or they smiled at the camera nice. You know, somehow you created this image of who they are, which is a complete lie because you don't know them and you believe this lie and you become infatuated with it. That's mental mind fucking right there to the max. And humans do it. I probably do it all the time. It's like actually insane and really bizarre if you think about how we do that. That, I mean, we do it with politicians. We see Trump for 10 minutes a whole week and you think you know him? Yo, there's a problem with that. You're in love with somebody who doesn't even know you exist unless you maybe send them enough money. (laughs) And that's your boy? Your boy don't even know who the fuck you are. Oh, really? 
doesn't care either. You've never spent a second in his head or walked in his shoes. You haven't even been to his house to look what his bedroom looks like, but you think you know him. Come on. That's a fucking, that's a mental disease that we're like really getting fucked up on. And I see that happen a lot with true crime. People fall in love with this stuff. And the people and the victims and the families that they've oh, never Hughes meant. He's got a list of women. I mean, writing him love letters. Richard Speck got love letters. And that will make money. And I'm sure people are like, kind of like, let's push this shit to see if it works. You know, or it's well, a, I'm sure, data mining that even. People, they're taking the pulse of the public and yes. seeing who, who, who gets affected by what and what buttons are we going to push yes. here and who's going to respond to that because we're all a bunch of friggin' guinea pigs anyway. You know, we're just in a one big fat laboratory and they're waiting to see what button pushes you and what button pushes you. It's a, it's, you know, it's becoming like, worse, I think, because of the proliferation of stuff that in video and in, in the, the mass media and the social media. You know, it's like, you um, know, like, even think of it this way. If, if you, if you truly, truly are like, I really want people to find out <clears throat> what happened here. And you would want a detective that is going to be completely 100% non bias at everything he looks at. But yet the person picking that detective is fucking 50% bias already on who they want to look at. Like, think about that. That makes no sense. You want it to be solved, but yet you're already just, you're already removing half the people because you fell in love with an image. Yeah. That is insane. Don't you want it solved correctly? Let everybody have a clean seat and look at it again. Can't pick and choose if you want a non-biased, good research or, you know, detective. It just makes no sense how people will contradict themselves. Well, you're hitting on something I was just thinking about this morning. I was just thinking about how it, basically people are, at heart, people are irrational. They're basically irrational. They're governed by fear, emotion, desire, you know, I sound like a great philosopher. I'm, I'm just another person making an observation. But I was thinking people are, and I learned that when I was practicing acupuncture because I was seeing people and I was getting the, the, I, the realization that at least in terms of their health, which scares most people a lot, they're very worried about their health, especially when something's going wrong. People are flat out irrational. And they have biases that they didn't know existed. And so knowing that we are that way and we tend to be that way, like Nick, what you're saying is you'd be completely unbiased, irrational when you make a choice of a detective. That's a tall order because most people have a bias. They might not even know that they have a bias. Mm. They might prefer somebody who is from Jersey City as opposed to somebody from Kansas City. Or they might want somebody who Ooh, went like to, that. was I, a New York City cop instead of a, a Charlotte, North well, Carolina the, cop. I mean, we have biases we don't know about. But this, these think tanks just exist on pointing out what those weaknesses are uh, and figuring out how to plot them in our daily path, you know? I mean, like even myself before, I, I you know, I'm, I'm looking to get some artwork done that I might want to try to do, like redo some stuff for the show. Mm -hmm. I was looking only really to, sp to try to give the business to like a specific group of people, either like, um, uh, like podcasters or whatever. But like, I mean, I ended up finding somebody that I didn't even know last night. That I think I'm going to stick yeah. with them because I have seen some right. of their stuff. But mm -hmm. um, like even then, like if you think about it, I, I, I'm being biased too because how do I know if I didn't look somewhere else, I'd find something done better, cheaper. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, we, yes, we are all biased. And I, I know maybe I was getting like a little like heated, but like, I just hate like in overall, what I was describing goes on everywhere. Politics, oh, yeah. true crime, music, pop artists. Mm -hmm. It's just a very weird thing that I mean, I'm sure I did all the time as a child. Maybe as mm -hmm. I just got older and things just I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, but it was just, I do find it to be very weird, you know? Yeah. You no, know, and to your point, Nick, to what you were saying is that most of the true crime community, I would say a majority of them are out to either become famous or make money. And so already oh, you were YouTube, starting right? from, yeah. yeah, and when, and you're starting off from that, that base camp one, where, where can it go from there? I mean, you're already starting with a biased situation because Everybody. you have to insert, you have to insert now a personality that you, uh, that you gravitate yeah. towards someone in order to gravitate towards your audience and if we and even in with smiley face killers 
we saw the corruption happening within detectives, within medical examiners, within there's already a bias there. So the mm-hmm. entire thing is not even subjective and discernment no. has like literally vacated the building. It's nowhere to be found with most of these true crime situations. No, so, it's a club, and you, you, we ain't in it, you know? It's it's a great big club, and we ain't in most of them, you know, yeah, fortunately yeah. for us. But, yeah, I, I see that in true crime a lot, and um, so I never really even was interested in doing a true crime-based channel. I mean, I, I do have a little tiny astrology channel, but that's just to teach what I know about looking at the chart. It's not... It's not to make much, it's not monetized. None of my stuff is, but it, right. it, it is a, it's an industry. And as it catches on, as true crime started to Correct. catch on in the, in the late 20 teens, you saw this huge uptick in channels on true crime. And um, I don't even watch most true crime channels. It's like, I don't trust a lot of them. I don't know where they're getting their information from. I don't know if they're fact checking what they talk about. And it, it's also an easy outlet for misinformation where that is maybe needed in certain cases like smiley face or whatever the big cases that are out there so it is it's a cottage industry as anything gets popular it becomes a, a money factory you just agree yeah. i agree for sure for sure on youtube i hate to say it oh yeah yeah very uh, absolutely very wild stuff out there it's a wild wild west out in the true crime world <laughs> I like to, I just kind of look around and crazy. watch. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. Oh yeah, it's it's yeah. interesting for sure. It's yeah. crazy. Yo, like like they're they they they're rough too. Like they should talk more the conspiracy community does. Oh yeah. Sure. It's, yeah, it's it's bad. It, it, the trolling <laughs> gets really intense. I've seen trolling that practically destroyed people. I mean, people quit. People had nervous breakdowns. I mean, it's really ser- a serious. Watching issue. that, sh- watching that shit made me calm down because I was like, "Fuck! I hope I don't look like that." <laughs> Like, <laughs> damn. Now you're yeah, good, Nick. Yeah, thanks. Good. Yeah, no, I've been. Yeah, well, honestly, I've been so busy. I just stay off social media anyway because it's just going to screw me up from doing what I'm doing. So, and I'm better off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's really what gets me going is social media, and I'm pretty sure like that's exactly what it's supposed to that's, do. That's what it that's does. Exactly <laughs> what it's supposed to do. I, I will look at a tweet. Some I had bacon and eggs for breakfast, and they get 250 likes and retweets, and then I'll post something about what a philosopher said. <laughs> Like one view or nothing, one view or nothing. I was like, okay, thanks a lot. I see where you guys are coming from. It's yeah. stupid it's, though. You know, it's just, yeah. uh, it, as long as you realize what it is and you don't fall into that pitfall, once in a while you find something of value, your friends post things of value. You guys post things of value to me. Thank you. And I, I hope I post things of value, but the rest of it is crap. I don't care who had bacon and eggs for breakfast. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Why didn't you invite? That's all I'm wondering. Why? Bring the string cheese with you, please. It's, 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 ah, like, please. it's like, what should I have? The bacon or the eggs? And it's like the chick's wearing a thong. It's like, okay. <laughs> really? I know. It's so dumb. That's why I got off Facebook. I hated Facebook so bad when oh, I was yeah. on there. I just hated it. I was just like, get out of there. Get out. I couldn't wait. And they wouldn't let me. They kept me on there for 30 days after I canceled. They kept trying to suck me back in. It's like, I want nothing to do with Facebook. I can't even log into it anymore, which is fine because I have no reason to, but. Yo, you know, I yeah. do feel bad about that because, like, I, fi- I mean, I kind of forget I have it. I just really stream out to it. And, like, maybe every, like, three or four months, like, I'll think about, like, checking the messages and I'll have, like, a ton of them in there. And I'm like, God damn, I feel so bad. So if anybody's <laughs> listening or actually seeing this on Facebook, I'm sorry. I just really, I, I always forget <laughs> to check. Yeah. Don't take it personally. Yeah, yeah. I think there's been a few people that I was like, yo, go over to Twitter or Instagram, and they've they've added me there. So, I mean, it yeah. worked out, but yeah. Cool. All right, awesome. That was a fun show. That was a good talk. Yeah. Uh, it was yeah. ex- exactly what I expected. Um, story time with B.D. Salerno. Um, again, just a very weird, interesting case. Um, I would love to see if, like, it actually got, like, reopened and, like, redone with, like, today's technology, too. I wish. I, I mean, wish. but then, I mean, but then nowadays with the way they're going with that, we'll get some, like, Fugazi DNA thing that, like, tied in, like, some random dude, that, I don't know, some weird story. Like, we're getting with Gilgo and everybody else lately, you know? It's all I this know. weird DNA that's popping up on, like, you know, sneakers or, you know, crusts and pizza boxes. <laughs> You know, or somehow a chick's hair is showing up on all the tape, but the dude did it. Like, you know what I'm like, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So, uh, uh, real quick, Lisa, you want to plug where, every, where people can find you? And I do have her link tree in the bottom as well. 
Let everybody so definitely know. check out the link tree because it's very short. It's just <laughs> Lisa. <laughs> Uh, I'm like, yo, why did I make a link tree? No, why do you have a link tree for one link? (laughs) It is. Seriously. She just left the link. um, You can find me on Twitter. So at least Lisa. And then also, because, you know, I like to plug it. um, Check out our website at Ecole Research Institute. A lot of BD's great stuff is there. Um, I do like that one piece that she wrote um, about occultism. And I... I loved it. And so we also have other contributors on the website. So if yes. you really like reading, please check it out. There is a well of information on this stuff, on, on different topics that a lot of contributors have spent time contributing. So yeah. check yeah. it out. And it's called researchinstitute.org. Yes. And like even though you're, th- you're on Instagram too, right? Yes. Yeah. The oh, account's yes, on Instagram. there. Yeah. 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 You yeah. forgot that. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I forget really about it. Yeah. Oh, for what it's worth. Yeah, you yeah. look at my stuff. You're the only one who does practically. <laughs> and another thing I do want to say, too, like a lot of things, like uh, whenever we cover like specific occultists or if we cover grimoires or books, odds are That's that right. does get actually redropped on the site around the time the episode comes out and like read for, you know, in like format that you could read. And believe it or not, oh. like sometimes there will be actually extra stuff in that because sometimes just time permitting, we will actually start cutting out a few lines, maybe a paragraph or two. So I'm just saying, if you don't mind reading, you might actually uh, see it. And the funny thing is, you might actually see it. It's like almost typed out like in conversation. <laughs> it's kind of funny. If you were to read it, you're like, wow, this is like them almost talking to each other. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's weird, yeah. <laughs> but no, it it's pretty cool. It it's is. pretty cool. So check it out. Uh, I think they're good reads. Um, a lot of there'll be a lot of like pictures too. Uh, you know, there was recent mm-hmm. stuff where I've even like thrown up like a lot of emblems on books and stuff. Heinrich Kuhnrat stuff. Yeah. yeah. So check the check out the site. Uh, it's got Brandy's been pumping out a lot of stuff. I, Ethan Indigo. Yeah. Yeah. Ethan Indigo. Leon with yes. some of his uh, Oregon stuff. Oregon. Yeah. Stuff. Uh, Brandy has some stuff on cults. That's that was really really good. Well done. Some of the shows that we've done with her, she kind of put in digitized oh, yeah. them. Yeah. So it's, I, I love it. So yeah. I mean, even a, even Leon, even Leon, Leon. I mean, not for nothing. I mean, that guy's got like scientific papers published. I mean, he's yes. and he's putting stuff on that site. It's pretty impressive. You know, I appreciate mm-hmm. stuff right. like that. Right. So yeah, there's pretty interesting. Uh, some pretty interesting things on there. And again, like really, it, I mean, it's not mine. Uh, it's everybody else's. I think go check out all their stuff. It's some really, really interesting stuff, and it's tons of different types of topics too. I mean, you can go into conspiracies, into occultism, into science. And there's art on there. You know, there's all tons of different mm-hmm. things. So definitely check it out. I'm hoping. I think I edited it. It might be pinned up already in the chat. I try to do that on the lives before we get it going. And uh, you know, and real quick too, I do want to add. You know, she did mention it. Uh, I know in the past she tends to leave out the word hour. But, I mean, Lisa did make that site with me. And, uh, honestly, it probably wouldn't be there if it wasn't her kind of pushing me to do it. You know, some people thought it might have been, like, an ego thing of mine. And, honestly, it was more of Lisa <laughs> trying to push push me to do something that I wanted to do. It was a vanity project. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was a vanity <laughs> project when it was, like, if, honestly, if it wasn't her pushing me to do it, Get it never would have got right. done. Get the quote right, Nick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and she did a lot. So, uh, yeah, it definitely is our site and just I want to thank you Lisa for helping with that site because she has added a lot in there herself and even the occultists in the books you know it's like half her she added that shit there's a lot yeah. there so thank you that's what's up um, that is the end of another occult rejects uh, everybody thank you in the chat that is what's up um, I do know there was like maybe some people in there that didn't agree with everything that I was saying but even though you were posting some of the evidence that you had I still threw it up on the board um, because I do think, you know, we should look at all sides. So I still even do appreciate difference of opinions. So I'll open for discussion. As long as it's said well, I'm fine with it. And I will even throw it up on the screen. I don't give a shit. I don't always have to be right. You know? (laughs) Yeah, I don't always have to be right. Half the time I think I'm wrong anyway. So uh, that is, yeah. Thank you, everybody in the chat. That's what's up. I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody that stops by and hangs out for a while and tries to give their own two cents and info. You know, that's what's up. Uh, And until the next one, everybody be well. Later.